This morning, uh, as we look at our Baptist history, and we, we each week are telling um, history of, of great men and women, I think 50 Baptists that everybody should know. And this morning, um, in my opinion, this is one of the, my favorite stories. Pastor Bowman just sighed and said, oh, no, I'll never get up here. Uh, but uh, number 37, and uh, this to me is one of, also one of the, the great, greatest stories in American history, I believe. And so I think you'll enjoy this this morning. And uh, George and Ethel Birch were godly Presbyterian missionaries in India. Um, they had a son, they, they, a, a son was born to them, John, in 1918. Two years later, they went back to the United States. I came back to the United States because of health issues. And it was there that they discovered uh, liberalism in their denomination, the Presbyterian Church. And uh, they began to attend a Baptist church where they soon were convinced by scripture and joined that church and, and they, were, they were baptized scripturally. John, uh, their little boy, was saved and baptized at the age of seven. Uh, John was a very gifted young man, um, mentally gifted, and it was very, it was very evident at, at an early age. Uh, he could read and memorize in an unusual way. Uh, he skipped several grades and graduated early, but at the head of his class. Uh, when he was 11, he went to a missions conference and his heart was stirred uh, towards missions. And, um, uh, he was enthralled by the speakers that he heard, and several days later, his parents found a note in the living room, in their living room, and it said this. He said, "The Lord is calling me to the mission field. I have, I have to answer the, uh, um, I have the answer to the death wail of the lost." And there was no question from that day forward um, what what he would do with his life. J. Frank Norris, the man we studied two weeks ago, um, was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas, and he held a meeting in Georgia uh, the summer that John graduated from Mercer University. And uh, it was there that uh, uh, John decided to go to uh, J. Frank Norris's seminary in Fort Worth. And so he enrolled in the Bible Baptist Seminary studying for the ministry. And there he studied under Norris for a year and a half. Uh, the Lord called him to China. And um, he went to China under the auspices of the First Baptist Church of Fort Worth. So our stories are interesting how they entwine. And it was July of 1940 when he arrived in, in China. Uh, within a year, this is his gifted mind, within a year he had learned the Chinese language. Uh, and he began a very effective work with the Chinese in their war-torn country. Um, he gave himself to preaching, to starting Baptist churches, and encouraging the Chinese Christians um, at great personal sacrifice to himself. Um, he uh, would have been very famous, I believe, and we know that now that he would be very famous had the English-speaking world known of his exploits and of his sacrifices, but that was not to be. Uh, Japan, for its part, had invaded China and was at war with, with, uh, with China. Uh, the U.S. was putting immense pressure upon Japan in support of the Nationals Chinese. These are the good guys. You'll hear me refer to the, uh, the Nationals Chinese once in a while. Uh, just in history, so you know they would eventually form the nation of Formosa, which is now Taiwan. So these are the good Chinese, in a sense of politically speaking. And uh, as, um, as, as we supported General Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationals Chinese, um, trying at the same time to uh, stay out of the conflict and not get involved in a war with Japan. As the, the, the Chinese-Japanese war progressed, uh, John's mission support dwindled to almost nothing, and eventually even his place of service came under uh, Japanese occupation. Uh, this didn't stop him as he continued to win souls and zealously spread the gospel, minister to the Baptist churches there in occupied China. Um, but the entire world was soon to be plunged into war as Japan was readying to, to uh, uh, attack the United States. And they did that on December 7, 1941, as they attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor. And we were now at war with the nation of Japan, the Empire of Japan. Uh, in this situation, John felt that he should volunteer to join the US Army. And he did that. His concern was that he thought this was the best way to help his country, the United States, and the best way to help the Chinese who he had come to serve. Um, his fluency with the language and familiar, familiarity with the culture of the people made him invaluable to the United States. As an ordained minister, um, he became a chaplain for a while, but then uh, General Chenault, the great uh, man General Chenault, um, asked him to become an intelligence officer and work behind enemy lines and supply um, the Air Force with, with much needed uh, information. 
Um, his role as a missionary and an American intelligence officer is really unprecedented in what, what he was able to accomplish. Um, right after the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor um, is one of the greatest or most thrilling stories of World War II. And many of you will know this story, but uh, we, we um, I'll just preface it by saying we can't imagine living in those dark days. We have never, none of us in this room have experienced um, the dark days of December and January of 1941. Um, I would say America's mood was not only devastated, but probably hopeless. Uh, the, the Japanese in one day destroyed almost all of our Navy. Um, now just think about that for a minute. Um, all but maybe two ships in the Pacific for sure. And um, so we were a devastated nation. And the United States needed a, a, a very, very much needed a more morale boost uh, at that time. And, and uh, you know, uh, and so a, a, a colonel, Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, thought of this idea. It was, a, it was a radical idea. He thought, why don't we do whatever we can to do a surprise bombing of Tokyo? That would set the Japanese on their heels because they never would expect that because they knew what they did to us. They were very, very calculated attack. They knew exactly what they were doing to us. And so it wasn't that easy because the, the bombers w couldn't fly that far normally. So they devised a plan to get an aircraft carrier within 400 miles of Japan. That's as far as, as close as they could get without being detected. And then launch these planes, which had never been able to fly off aircraft carriers before, of uh, these type of planes, bombers and bomb Tokyo. Well, there was only one problem with that plan. It was a great plan. And they worked for months to get it together. But the problem with the plan was it was a one-way ticket because when you're loaded with bombs and loaded with fuel, there was no coming back. You were going to bomb Tokyo, and then those planes would have to crash land in China. So the men knew, and Doolittle's men, his, his men knew that this was probably a one-way ticket but they eagerly volunteered, much needed plan. These, these, this is a day of great heroes, folks, uh, real heroes. I'll mention that in just a minute. But, but um, so uh, they did that, and uh, they, they, uh, uh, they were detected 600 miles out, so it was really bad, and they had to fly out those ships. And um, they did bomb Tokyo, and all those planes crash-landed in China. Now, what's amazing is everybody survived the crash landing. One, one crew was captured by the Japanese. They were later tortured and executed. But all the other crew, all the other crews, and Doolittle himself, uh, survived amazingly. Um, well, they wandered the Chinese landscape for a while, not knowing where they were, because I'll be honest with you, probably that part of the, of the plan was not as developed because nobody, they didn't really think you know, too many would survive. And so, uh, but here's the amazing part of the story. Um, God in his providence, uh, led John Birch to them. And he was able to take the entire, all those crews of men to United States troops into safety. Um, a true American hero, just an amazing story. One of the most thrilling stories of World War II. Uh, John Birch was a remarkable soldier. Well, we jump forward now four years as the, as the war comes to an end. Um, John had some serious spiritual and political conclusions about the significance of the war, and uh, very interesting thoughts uh, his were. He wrote to his family, he said, I believe that this war will set the stage for the Antichrist. I'll have a lot to tell you when I get home, things about the future of China and of the world. Um, as he prepared to come home uh, when the war was over, uh, he and 11 other Americans and a couple of Chinese men, nationalist Chinese, they had one last mission to settle some things with some weapons that were stored there in China. And uh, however, they were detained by uh, the communist Chinese. Um, these were the, the red Chinese. Um, and they demanded that he reveal the whereabouts of these weapons. And they demanded that he reveal the whereabouts of other, the nationalist Chinese, the good guys, the, the good Chinese, who the red Chinese hated and, and wanted to exterminate. Uh, John refused to divulge anything, thinking that these are our allies. The red Chinese are our allies, so you know they can't what are they going to do to me? But he refused to, to uh, divulge anything. But on August 25th, 1945, uh, John Birch was executed by these soldiers who were our allies. Um, his personal assistant, Tung, uh, was also shot and left for dead, but miraculously escaped. He was able to give an eyewitness account to what exactly happened and John's abuse at the hands of the Chinese. Um, however, instead of holding the Chinese communists responsible for this hostile action, the American government decided that the incident should be hidden. Uh, they didn't want to agitate the communists. 
Um, some, some conspiracies are true. <laughs> and uh, the American government decided to hide that. The story of the murder of John Birch became a tightly guarded secret and actually wasn't declassified until President Reagan declassified it in the 1980s. Um, really a sad part of the story. Um, a role reporter who had been in China during that time wrote um, of John's life and his service in a, in a letter to his parents. And he says, yesterday, I read of John's death and was very shocked. Your son was one of the finest men who ever came to China. He lived an exemplary life. He never did anything unkind to anyone. He believed that wars were and are due to the lack of belief in God. He exerted a profound effect upon the thousands of people who came in contact with him. His loss is a great loss, not only for China, but to America and the world. He loved China and the Chinese people dearly and planned to stay in China all his life. During the war, he performed many dangerous and heroic feats. As a member of U.S. intelligence and U.S. Army intelligence, he often parachuted uh, into Japanese areas and spent weeks and months behind, lines, behind the lines preaching the gospel and ministering to the churches there. He was a beloved man in China and widely known over the entire continent. And he said, I understand that no news agency was allowed to send out the story of your son's death from China for fear of arousing China, uh, the Chinese communists and American relations uh, to a higher pitch of instability. So his death was, no, uh, was not mentioned in any news story in, uh, from China. Otherwise, it would have been on the front page of every paper in the United States. Um, that's a great testimony, uh, testimonial to, to John. Uh, years later, in 1958, uh, the great anti-communist, uh, this is where you may know the name, of course, we recognize the name, um, Robert Welch formed an organization that he wanted to, that would uphold, he wanted to uphold the uh, traditional American values and the sovereignty of the United States Constitution. Um, it became a great anti-communist organization, and Welch felt that uh, John Birch uh, embodied uh, the greatest of Christian and American values, and he named the organization the John Birch Society, and that's where a name you, you may know. But John Birch was a great man, a true hero. Um, he was a, a soldier of the cross and a hero for, for our country. Um, he was an all-out fundamentalist who fought, uh, took a stand against modernism as it creeped into the Southern Baptist Convention and to, into the churches there, um, uh, especially when he was a seminary student. Uh, he went to China to help the fundamental Baptist churches there who were laboring um, you know, faithfully in, in China. And he's never received the just uh, reward, I think, and recognition for his World War II uh, heroics. Um, but the story, because of the testimony of the men who knew him um, and the family members who knew him, have inspired thousands of Christians for the last 75 years. Um, how he lived and his accomplishments for Christ are one of the greatest American stories. And we want to thank the Lord for this man. You know, I think, uh, I couldn't help but think, that in a day when even Christian young people have fictional Avengers posters on their bedroom walls as their heroes, parents, could I, could I recommend to you uh, John Birch as a true hero for your children? Um, this was a great man of God and a great fundamental Baptist. And we thank the Lord this morning for him and his testimony.